I am joined by Eric Crittenden, Chief Investment Officer of Standpoint Asset Management. Eric, great to have you on Forward Guidance. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Jack. How are you? I'm glad you're here, Eric. So I think your style at, at Standpoint Asset Management is uh, macro investing, but it has a, a different flavor. It's called macro trend. What is what is macro trend? Tell us about sort of your, your investment style that you engage in. Sure. So macro to us means top down and global. Those are the two words I like to use to describe it. So it means that our opportunity set is very wide. Uh, we're looking for trends and opportunities all around the globe in different asset classes. So things like grains, corn and wheat, uh, precious metals, industrial metals, uh, foreign bonds, domestic bonds, currencies, you name it. We're looking for both the opportunity to diversify our risk, but the opportunity for profit as well. If I were to ask you, you know, and this is public you, on, on standpointfunds.com, uh, uh, just your, your position, you recently opened a short positions in soybeans. How do you go about that? I mean, are you, you know, go, doing a deep dive on the fundamentals, the weather, the supply and demand, or is it based on the uh, quantitative analysis of, you know, there are too many people who are long it, so we'll be contrarian and go short it. Why are you short soybeans, for example? It's a great question. Um, everything we look at is supply and demand based, but it's based upon the liquidity that we observe in the market, the term structure in the market, and the price or the, the recent returns in the market. So we feel that the markets are pretty good discounting mechanisms, and they're very good at bringing buyers and sellers together in an effort to clear the market uh, in order to create balance. So we track um, the 75 most liquid futures markets in the world. And we capture the whole futures curve, you know, all the settlement prices, the volume, the open interest, collect all that information in a database, uh, clean it up, and then essentially run some relatively simple old school trend rules on it to find supply demand imbalances where liquidity might be rising, a market might be breaking down, maybe it's going into contango or backwardation. And then we take uh, positions in markets, you know, long positions in rising markets and short positions in falling markets and size those positions according to our risk appetite and try to main maintain a balanced portfolio that's got exposure all around the globe and in different asset classes. And then we stick with winning positions for as long as they remain winning positions. And then in a very disciplined manner, close out losing positions and keep losses small before they snowball into something that we're not uh, looking to experience. Got it. So tight stop losses and let the winners ride. Uh, the, I would take issue with the word tight. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, tight means very close. Uh, close stop losses can result in you having a high losing percentage, meaning, you know, a lot of your trades aren't working out. So our stop losses are, uh, derived statistically to have uh, you know a relatively stable winning percentage of about you know 45 50 percent um, but we don't want to it's tight stop losses to result in high turnover and a lot of trading that isn't necessarily more profitable than moderate or loose stop losses so we use various levels of stop losses we try to diversify that model risk away uh, but I wouldn't describe them as tight. They're disciplined and they're always honored, but they're not tight in the context of being close to the price. Got it. So your, your main signal there, one of the large signals is price decline. So would that be the, the old adage of, uh, you know, the trend is your friend, short something that's going down, go long something that's going up? Is, is that sort of the essence of the trend following that's in macro trend? Yeah, I would say that that's true. Um, Prices uh, and returns are one component, term structures another, and then liquidity is the third. Uh, if I had to assign a weighting to those, I'd say you know forty to forty five percent is uh, raw price movements, uh, with another twenty five to thirty percent in uh, term structure, and then the balance in liquidity changes. Got it. All right, so let's move away from sort of the the fields and let's go uh, into the stock market, the bond market. Uh, U.S. stock markets has been on a tear, uh, as has the Japanese equity market, which is absolutely on fire. I, you know, up, up above twenty percent, I think, maybe much more above twenty percent. I think you recently, uh, and maybe even before then, have have been long U.S. stocks uh, and Japanese equities. Could you outline the way you got there through your your three uh, sort of filters? Uh, number one being trend, the, the fr number two being term structure, and number three being um, liquidity. Yeah, it's true. We're we've been long Japan for quite a while now. Um, 
long the US as well and been long Europe, which has been a very interesting trade. I mean, everyone's bearish on European, you know, profitability of European corporations. Uh, so when that trade came in a while back, I think it was, you know, six, nine months ago. Um, I like trades like that because they they're psychologically difficult to put on. And in my experience, I think I'm on my 26th year in the industry now. The trades that are the toughest psychologically to put on generally turn out to be the big winners that you needed all along. It's That's just the way it works. If it's hard to do, it's probably worth it. Uh, the trades that make perfect sense and are very comfortable psychologically, generally speaking, don't work out. And it's that wall of worry, discounting mechanism nature of the market where you know it's, it's already priced in. If it's comfortable, it's probably already priced in. So, But anyways, that's a little off topic. Oh, it's, it's um, good. Yeah. So we take term structure, liquidity and price movements and roll them all into one analysis. And then, you know, the the rules that we've written, which are strictly enforced, essentially just tell us we should be long the Nikkei or the Topix or both in this case over in Japan. Uh, why that signal occurred would require me to go into the system and kind of parse it out. You know, how much of it was due to price appreciation, how much of it was due to term structure and how much of our position size is a function of the open interest or the liquidity in the underlying market. So that's a complex topic uh, that I could, we could talk for three hours about so I won't bore you with it, but needless to say, we got all three for, for Japan, um, for Europe, uh, and then more recently the U S markets. You're not, you're not boring me at all. So if, if on the spectrum of discretionary to systematic, discretionary is, you know, the portfolio manager just has a feeling that, you know, Europe's going to go up and they could, they could change their mind and go, you know, 200% long, 200% short, purely at their own basis. And then systematic on the other side is very rules-based. Oh, my rule, my system told me to do this, so I'm going to do this. My system told me, are, it sounds like uh, you and, and, and Standpoint are, are quite systematic. Yeah, I would say more than 99% systematic. And that's by design. Um, if I had to go back in time and, and give you a, an estimate of what my returns would have been from being a discretionary manager, I wouldn't be very proud of those numbers. Um, but I'm very proud of the systematic results. Um, it just enforces discipline and it keeps you know, losses small and forces you into those uncomfortable trades that oftentimes go on to be the big winners. So I will say this, though, that when you run it in a mutual fund like we do, uh, there needs to be an element of discretion that's possible uh, because we're subject to uh, risk rules, you know, value at risk rules, leverage rules. I mean, the Investment Act of 1940 is pretty comprehensive. So there are times where you, there are certain instruments that you don't want to allow into the portfolio. Like I can't put Bitcoin into the portfolio. It just causes too many compliance um, and social problems. You know, um, that's, that's another topic. Um, and then there's certain markets that bring leverage levels that you just don't want to put in a mutual fund because we've got people with retirement money and, um, you know, people like my mom don't want to be buying something it's using a tremendous amount of leverage so we got to keep those leverage levels at a really you know reasonable uh, level so but that's a very small it's uh, just a couple of things um over the years where i've had to think that through and say well we don't want that in the portfolio and every portfolio manager has to deal with that on some level and i don't know a way to make that systematic um so that part's going to be discretionary but it's a very minor component of the overall um, operations so Eric, if I if I had to ask you, why is it that the rules that you and your team have put together at Standpoint, why is it that they make money? Why is it that the signals that they generate, you know, maybe if they're only quote right forty five percent of the time, they more than make up for that. So you know, the, the, it has a positive expected return. Like, what is? Don't tell me you know the secret sauce, but is it pretty much looking? Oh, historically, this strategy would have worked, and you know, if we could had a time machine and could go back, we we you know know it perfectly. That'd be great. We don't, but we're just going to assume that you know, 2023 is going to be, you know, just like the past 100 years of investing uh, with some degree of, of confidence. And, you know, if we're right, that that's why it works. Or is this something completely different? Um, well, so at Standpoint, we attack this topic from two different angles. You know, one is just purely computer science based, where we mm -hmm. collect data from every futures market that's that's ever existed going back to 1970, foreign markets, U.S. markets. Uh, and that's a painstaking process. You know, you go back in time and, and get that data that doesn't exist today. There's no pork belly futures today. There's no onion or potato futures today, but they were around in the 60s and 70s and 80s. 
So in order to avoid all the, the biases and errors that plague, you know, back testing, you need to go back and recreate history as it actually looked, as it actually unfolded through time. And that's, that's not easy to do, but that happens to be my um, specialty. It's, I, I, my, my degree was in computational finance with a minor in computer science with a healthy dose of ag economics in there. So, and I have a deep respect for the biases that plague um financial research. You know, you got to go back and recreate history as it actually looked, not how it looks now, which means you have to have all the errors in there because they would have been seeing them in real time and taking action off of them, you know, errors in pricing and whatnot. So I could write a set of encyclopedias about that and we're not going to do that today, but I'll tell you that. So we've, we've done the research with on the quantitative side and we can see historically what appears to have worked well and what appears to not have worked well. So you can zero in on rules um, and strategies that appear to have been highly profitable historically and others that just weren't. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, that's valuable. Um, but we also attack it from the other perspective and this is kind of a me thing, an Eric thing where Mm -hmm. I, um, I grew up on a farm in Kansas. Um, I lived in Kansas for a long time. I've had a lot of exposure to professional hedgers, uh, in the agricultural and energy sector. Uh, I went to Wichita state university and one of the the biggest uh, contributors was Coke Industries, K-O-C-H. And they, I think they trade like 20% of the commodities in the world. So I had a lot of friends that um, worked in hedging departments at various um, um, commodity trading firms and energy trading firms back then. And I got to view the world through their eyes, you know, what they see. Uh, and that's very illuminating because hedgers aren't trying to make money in the markets. What they're trying to do is to create negative correlation to something inside of their core business uh, for lots of reasons. One, it really lowers their financing cost if they can hedge, you know, their cash flow risk and hedge away their bankruptcy risk. And so they could lose a lot of money hedging, but save uh, an order of magnitude more than that on their own financing costs. Because a lender will say, oh, we'll lend to you at, you know, a 6% spread instead of a 15% spread. Because if you didn't hedge at all, you'd, you know, the risk that you'd go bankrupt is much higher. Yes. Yeah. And bankruptcy is like a hurricane where it's, you know, if you, if you live four miles inland, you know, your insurance costs are one tenth. They are if you live on a barrier island on the coast of Florida. Right. So and that's because of that catastrophic bankruptcy risk or hurricane risk. When the eye wall hits you, everything's gone. So if you lose two percent a year hedging, uh, you can save yourself four and a half percent a year on your cost of capital. Um, so it makes sense to do that. So that's one counterintuitive way that um, you can kind of justify hedgers losing money in the futures markets and the forward markets. Um, the other one is, you know, as it's related is that internally, you know, their um, their equity is worth a lot more if their cash flows are more predictable. And everyone wants to hedge their bankruptcy risks. Well, not everyone, but <laughs> everyone who stays in business for a long time uh, tends to do something to hedge their bankruptcy risk. So. Now, if you establish a position in the futures markets that ne- that's negatively correlated with a profitable position in your business, you know you should lose money on your hedge. The same way, I hope Jack, you lose money on your car insurance. Mm-hmm. You know that that's a hedge, right? And if you were making money on your car insurance, you know that's it's not a great way to make money. So it's similar. So if you think of it as an ecosystem where you know it's, it's a zero sum game the derivatives markets the futures markets for a participant like me to go in there and say hey i'm going to compound at 8 10 12% a year uh, somebody has to lose that money on the other side of the transaction consistently and they have to do it at scale at size right so who is that well it's not other firms like me um, like like standpoint because if they start to lose money they're just going to get smaller and go out of business Right. And it's not small speculators. They don't have the capital. They make up about 5% of the market. So what that means is it's the commercial participants. And um, so what we have to do is trade in a way that is opposite to them and provide liquidity to them in their time of need. And it just so happens that on a dollar weighted basis, they like to sell rising markets to lock in profit margins. And they like to buy falling markets to lock in input costs because that's what creates an effective hedge for them. Trend following is basically the opposite of doing that. It's buying rising markets from them and selling falling markets to them. Now, if they were to make money on their hedge, that would mean that that would be an economic world that's kind of crazy, right? They make money in their core business and they get this beneficial hedge and someone pays them to put the hedge on. That doesn't make any economic sense. So 
anyways, that's the really condensed version of a complex topic. Um, but that's important to me because I need both uh, a fundamental economic rationale for why this should work combined with the empirical data, you know, 50 years of historical simulations to say that it appears to have worked in the past, then I can identify things that don't work and I can reconcile the hypothesis against what I know about the actual commercial industry. Got it. So yeah, when, when folks look at like a commercial of traders, there's uh, the commercial, often the shorts, and then there's the speculative, large speculators, you know, yourself would be included, standpoint, and then there's the small speculators, which you say, at least in some commodity markets are, are 5% of the market. How would you differentiate? How does the commodity markets, the oil markets, the grains markets differ from non-physical uh, com- commodities such as like the S&P 500 or interest rate futures? Like when when you look at the commitment of traders report and it says that commercials are short the S&P 500, who are the commercials? It's not like you know, ExxonMobil making oil. Who's, who's making the S&P 500? Yeah, I would say that the COT report, uh, COT report, Commitment of traders, and for people that aren't familiar with it, uh, I think that was a very valuable report back in the 80s and 90s. I think it's gotten really um, opaque since then because of all the consolidation in financial services. So um, farmers, you know, in Kansas, you know, hedge differently today. You know, the the mechanism by which they get their hedge is can be quite a bit different today than it was in the 90s and 80s and 70s. Um, so. The COT report essentially looks at who is reporting the position and tries to classify that entity. So if it's Goldman Sachs reporting a position, they'll say, oh, it's a commercial. Uh, but if it's a hedge fund reporting a position, they'll say it's a speculator. Um, but through the use of swaps and con- you know complicated hedging programs through insurance companies and intermediaries and whatnot, you can't really tell who's who anymore. That's my yeah. personal opinion. On it, so but I think the same. If that hedging pressure is there, it's going to show up in the trends. It'll show up in the term structure, and in the, I have to make the assumption that hedgers want to buy declining markets and sell rising markets because that's the way it's been for two thousand years, even going back to feudal Japan with rice futures. Um, so I just that's my belief, and so I'm going to short declining markets, buy rising markets, set a stop loss, budget the trade. Uh, put it on and then follow it with discipline and assume that some hedger on the other side is paying me a risk premium over time. Am I right every time? No, we lose on half or a little bit more than half of our trades, but we keep those losses small. Uh, When we win, those wins are much bigger, historically speaking, uh, and just wash, rinse, repeat. Um, So it is nothing but circumstantial evidence in, in a circular conversation uh, but I like that because if you actually could prove this stuff scientifically, this space would be a lot more crowded and my profit margins would go down. So I'm willing to rely on the circumstantial evidence at this point. Got it. So oil, you know, having been $120 for uh, Western Texas Intermediate, uh, I think around June last year, it's been steadily declining. So you say a hedgers buy into declining market. So have they been buying uh, into the de- declining market of you know WTI or or Brent? And then when they're quote buying, they're, are they they're not going long? They're just are they just uh, cashing in their short position, which made money? Um, yes, I think that's a fair characterization. I mean, somebody was buying on the way down. I mean, I watch those markets every day, and you can see the volumes just flooding in. Uh, and while markets are going down, open interest uh, is oftentimes staying the same or going up, and there's lots of volumes. There's definitely people buying. So the the thesis is that yes, net net, um, large commercial players are accumulating positions, and you can kind of see that on the COT report. The COT report is still relatively descriptive for certain markets. And I would say crude oil is one of those markets where it's it's not really terribly difficult to distinguish between speculators and hedgers in, in that particular market. So, And if you look at it, you'll see that in declining markets, the green line, which is the commercials, generally go up uh, in terms of going long. And uh, speculators, which is typically the red line, uh, will be net short. And then when it flips and crude oil goes up, you'll see that position cross over and go the other way. Can I prove that that's what's happening? No, but I I think that the the circumstantial evidence suggests that, yes, that's exactly what's happening. Got it. So you've, you've been short oil for a little bit as it's been declining. That seems, seems like a good trade. What would you have to see or what would your models have to see, your rules have to see for you to you know close out, cover your oil short, or even go long? 
So it would have to go up um, a bit more. Uh, I don't want to put numbers out there. Can't do that. But yeah. I mean, at some point, uh, the model would say, all right, you've lost what you budgeted on this. Uh, would probably still be a highly profitable trade given where we shorted it. But at some point, you know, statistically speaking, it's just no longer trending lower. Uh, something's changed in the supply demand dynamic. And the odds are we should close this position out and not risk you know, any more losses in that position. Uh, beyond that, it would have to you know go higher or sideways for some period of time and then start to make a new six month or a nine month high, something like that. And the models would say, hey, this thing might be entering an uptrend. It might be going on a run here. So uh, calibrate your, your risk budget, cal calculate the number of contracts that you should buy and get after that and get those positions on. And then it's the same thing over and over. It's really quite boring. I like it that way. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, wanted to let you know about Blockworks' upcoming crypto event, Permissionless 2. This ultimate DeFi gathering will be taking place in Austin on the 11th to the 13th of September 2023. It will feature the very best discussions on ZK tech, rollups, account abstraction, MEV, and much, much more. All the big hitters in crypto are going to be there, so if you're into crypto, you need to be there too. To get a 20% discount to a full three-day pass to Permissionless 2, Click the link in the description and use code guidance 20. That's guidance 20. Thanks. Let's get back to the episode. An entity who would be buying into a declining market or covering into a declining market would be in the oil market, a oil producer, a hedger. Uh, I, I tried to get at this question previously, but someone who would be buying S&P 500 futures as the S&P 500 is going down or shorting them as they go up. Would that be a hedge fund who has you know long core positions and is sort of hedging them, or sort of in, in the world of the S and P five hundred or other you know other stock uh, in stock index futures? Who are the different players? Yeah. Okay. So you did ask that question, and I didn't dodge it on purpose. So not all markets are perfectly symmetrical when it comes to um, hedging pressure, hedger speculator relationship. So. In the context of um, stock index futures, how many people buy stock indexes to hedge? Nobody really comes to mind, right? Uh, everyone sells them to hedge, yeah. you know, but nobody buys them to hedge. A, a well, handful of activist short seller funds, maybe, who are at, you know, but that's like one one percent of one percent of the market. Yeah, yeah, and I, I've 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 looked at this, you know, because this uh, bedeviled me for a while, thinking that well, this needs to be symmetrical, and it just it isn't. Certain markets are symmetrical, other ones aren't. But I did find that a lot of pension funds will use futures as a means of trying to match their asset liability because they know they've got money coming in at some point, uh, and they don't want to. Uh, miss out on something because they're on the hook for it or whatever. So they'll use futures uh, until they get the actual cash and then they can deploy it into the cash securities they want. Um, but you know what? Some markets just aren't perfectly symmetrical and stock indexes, um, I think, meet that description and most of the hedging pressures on the short side. Um, that doesn't mean that they trade at a permanent discount though or premium because they're essentially fungible, right? Like if you look at CNBC and I haven't watched CNBC since the late nineties, but wow. uh, I just, I don't watch TV. Uh, but I remember they'd show the premium and the discounts, you know, in the morning uh, before oh. the market opened. And that's yeah, I don't think they do that anymore. Or, no? or maybe that, is that what they say when they say fair value? Yes, yes. Okay. They do say, okay. Yeah. So that's just mixing, you know, cause with the futures, you're not getting the dividend component. So they're taking the T bills and the futures and doing some calculations and trying to tell you what fair value is based upon where the spot cash is trading and whatnot. So my point here though, is that futures will match the cash equity world. If you take the non-margin deposit <clears throat> and invest it in treasury bills, and then you factor in the amount of the discount of the premium that will, the algebra gives you the, the dividend yield that way. So mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of term structure value in, unless you're doing some synthetic stuff with having dividends offshore. People do that for tax purposes or they used to. I think it's illegal now. Um, but another. Is, sorry, uh, let me explain. Like if you're short a single stock that pays a 10% dividend, you're going to have to pay that 10%, uh, you know, in, in one year. Uh, what is that? Uh, June 2024. So if you're buying put or call options against that one year, the four, the one year forward price would be, would take that into account. So it would be, uh, so it might appear that puts are 
more expensive than calls in terms of implied volatility. If you look it up on like Yahoo Finance, but that's not actually the case. It's because the forward price is lower. Correct. Yeah, it's yeah. all going to get priced in. So it should. And there, you, th right. those markets used to be um, inefficient and you could, you could, you know, create some sort of an arbitrage, but I don't think it's the case anymore. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So yeah, so that's the S&P uh, 500. And then how big is S&P 500 futures relative to the ETFs like SPY, which, you know, is just the S&P 500 divided by 10, you know, it's 427 instead of 4270. Those have gotten pretty big. Yeah, they're astronomically liquid. Um, yeah. It's the largest market in the world. So the ETF is large, SPY ETF larger than S&P 500 futures? No, I wouldn't say that. I haven't oh. actually made that. S&P 500 e-mini contract is is the largest futures market in the world. Uh, in terms of notional value, I haven't looked at that, but the, I'm sure that collectively all of the S&P ETFs, you know, the Vanguard and the State Street and the BlackRock and the that's going to be very big too. It's probably bigger than the futures market. Got it. So if an oil company, let's say ExxonMobil, buying into a declining market, and it's not that that trade is a mistake, uh, it's good for them, for their business, lower cost of capital, you know, higher equity prices, you know, more stable, decrease their bankruptcy risk. But it may be true that you know, if you flip that coin a million times, it's a negatively returning trade for whatever reason. Is that true? You know, when people short S&P, if a hedge fund manager who, uh, you know, owns a lot of stocks and then they short the S&P 500 against it, are they shorting into a rising market? And do those, you know, are most, are in the same way that, you know, most people who, uh, you know, you know, try, try trading the stock market, like are, are going to lose, are, are most S&P 500 future wagers or, or hedges you know, negative returning trades? Empirically, yes, um, but I don't think that it's for the reason that uh, we're talking about. It's just that the market's gone up, you know, historically speaking. Um, S and P five hundred futures are pretty fairly priced. I don't think they have this risk premium talking about um, that you see in symmetrical markets. So all the commodities um, are mostly symmetrical. The stock indexes are a different beast. They're actually a construction underneath. <laughs> And then they're uh, they, they they're available in a futures contract uh, because it's very efficient, uh, capital efficient. You only have to post margin, um, and then they're essentially fungible through arbitrage into the cash market. But like you mentioned earlier, there's just not a lot of hedging pressure on the buy side, so they're almost like a, just a synthetic way of getting the same thing that you can get in the stock market. So um, I, my hedger speculator thesis. Uh, I believe holds for pure and symmetrical markets, but in the stock index world, I think you're just going to match whatever the underlying equity. It, as long as you invest the non-margin money into T bills, you're just going to get the market's return. Got it. How does liquidity impact whether you are a buyer or a seller? Are you a buyer when there's a lot of liquidity, or are you a buyer when there's a low amount of liquidity? So there's two ways. Liquidity determines <clears throat> whether we will consider a market. So, for example, we don't have palladium in the portfolio because it's not liquid enough. It didn't make the cut. Platinum did by a small margin. So that's one way. You're either in our university or not in our universe. Everyone has to have a line somewhere. Uh, that's one way. The other way liquidity affects um, us is through position sizing. It doesn't affect the direction of mm -hmm. the trade. It affects the size of the trade. And the size of the trade is crucially important. Um, you know, we... Started off very small as a firm four years ago. Now we're not so small, um, but the strategy is the same. And that's because we've always run the strategy like it had more than $10 billion in it. You know, the model believes it has this money in it. And then we just ratio it down to whatever our actual asset base, which is not $10 billion. Um, that's important because it allows you to offer the same strategy in year six, eight, 10 that you did in years one, two, and three. So I'm, I'm sure you've run into this where you see some track record or strategy that looks compelling uh, and you go and take a look at it and you realize that they did all this great, uh, they delivered all these great returns with 20 million bucks and they get to a billion dollars and nothing seems to work anymore. And they say, mm -hmm. well, we've got capacity constraints and uh, I don't want to deal with that problem. You know, that, that's, you know, so we have to do the things we do by limiting ourselves to liquid markets and rewarding the more liquid markets with more size and capacity. That's the only way to 
make sure that, you know, what you're doing in the future, if you're fortunate enough to be successful, uh, that the strategy can stay the same over the time. Got it. So is it true, I'm just pulling it up, that you, the, the fund launched at the very beginning of January 2020? Is that true? Yes. Okay. So you had maybe two two months of a bull market, January and February 2020, and then March was an absolute catastrophe for uh, most investors and and the stock market. Uh, but just you know, looking at your performance, it seems like you, you know, your drawdown was significantly less than the S P 500. What? Uh, how did you weather that storm? And then honestly, what impresses me more, just looking at this chart, is not that you you know did did all right during March 2020, but that you you went back long. So many people, oh my God, I, I didn't lose any money during March 2020. And then they sat out the entire you know, bull market. So yeah, I mean, what to what do you attribute this uh, success? I mean, what what rules or uh, your know, habits do you think, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that we implemented this because if we didn't implement this, you know, things might've ended up a little different. Yeah. So I remember that time vividly. We were so excited um, to start this new company and then finally get our fund launched and we synced up with the model and the model was in a full risk on posture, bull market, everything's great. Uh, and then you know what happened next. Um, so we launched, yeah, beginning of 2020. And then in the middle of February, everything in the world started to change. We started getting short signals in every energy market on the planet. And these are big trades, you know, natural gas, Brent crude, crude oil, gas oil, uh, heating oil. I mean, these are big markets. They're important markets. And we started getting short signals in all of them. And we started getting buy signals in flight to quality currencies like the Swiss franc. Uh, we started getting buy signals in certain bonds that were already trading at negative yields. And I'm like, wow, that is something bad is happening. Um, so we follow the system religiously. Um, it's important to stay disciplined. And like I mentioned a couple times, and I hope people remember this, the uncomfortable trades are the ones you have, you can never skip them. You just can't do it because as we will talk about in a minute, those short energy positions are what saved us. Uh, that's what made all the difference because I don't know if you remember, but crude oil went from 75 a barrel to negative, negative $35 a barrel. Um, and it happened fast and we were heavily short those. So that went a long way towards offsetting the losses we had in our dedicated long equity exposure and allowed us to have a small drawdown um, when the panic set in. So there was that. Um, and again, those were uncomfortable psychologically uncomfortable trades. Um, not uncomfortable for me. You know, I've been doing this for 25 years, so I know when I see it that it's just, I know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to follow the model. Um, uncomfortable for other people that are asking me, why are you shorting crude oil at $75 a barrel? I mean, how much lower can it possibly go? Well, the ans ultimate answer ended up being negative 35. <laughs> so, um, and then you ask the question, well, how then did we turn around and get long later in the year? Same thing. Uh, things changed. The government did what they did. Uh, the markets uh, cleared the market supply and demand. And next thing you know, you've got uh, energy prices going up. You got stock markets going up. You got all kinds of risk assets going up, food products, agriculture. Inflation was, was at the time, no one was worried about inflation, but it really started to pick up on the internal statistics. You, you mentioned AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning. How much machine learning and artificial intelligence do you use? I mean, it sounds like rules-based, ultra-systematic. It sounds like there's a, a lot of you know, use of computers there, right? Yeah, that can be um, misleading, though. So uh, AI and machine learning are very, very interesting to me. I'm, I'm kind of sort of a data science scientist. You know, I, I did a lot of that work. I took a lot of those classes twice in my life. It's very interesting, uh, but I'm very skeptical uh, about it because, and this kind of relates back to what we were talking about earlier, where we're extracting a risk premium from the hedgers, right? I, I believe there are three, four, maybe five structural risk premium in the world. And that hasn't changed since they had rice forward contracts in feudal Japan. It just is the way it is. There's only, so you can't create new risk premia um, out of thin air, you know, by banging away on a, on a keyboard. So uh, data science and machine learning can uncover things that are there that you don't already know about, but they're not creating new things. So in my experience or my, my intuition tells me that it's a lot safer and more durable to go after the structural risk premia that I know to be there, that I believe in, that I know how to harvest and that I believe is sustainable 
than it is to get into the shallow, bloody, shark-filled waters with all the brilliant data scientists out there that are trying to uncover risk premia we don't know about um, or fooling themselves into seeing risk premia that aren't really structurally there. And I think it's about 50-50 on what's happening there. So it's a... um, And I'm happy with the way I'm doing it, the way at standpoint, we're very happy with this kind of simple, humble approach. Uh, And it's, I think it's simple and humble enough that it's off the radar of, of a lot of firms that are looking for something much more exciting, much more marketable. Um, But does it work better? I would contend, no, it doesn't work better. I think that Berkshire Hathaway has uh, almost a, um, a monopoly on this type of thinking that just do the old school blocking and tackling that no one else seems to want to do because it's not exciting and you'll do better than other people. I don't disagree with that philosophy. Artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. machine learning, all the, you know, smart quant PhDs, they're all, all get in a room together and run all these algorithms, do all these back tests showing, Oh, actually, you know, if you, you know, short the S&P 500 at 931 and you, then you double down buyback at 938, actually you, you, you're, you're, Sharp with the sharp of seven, you'll you'll return you know thirty percent in, in a year. Yeah, where where do those people go go wrong? And when you say we we like to keep it simple, and you know most people want to be more complex, what are they hunting for? What's the holy grail they're hunting for that you say you know what I'm fine just just where I am? What you just described is an important point. So there, there's there's two schools of thought in in this kind of alternative investment industry. There's the I'm exploiting an inefficiency school. And then there's, I'm harvesting a structural risk premium school. I'm firmly in this camp over here. Um, Can you explain that difference for for us, please? Yeah. So exploiting an inefficiency is something like, you know, arbitrage strategies or having satellite data that other people don't have so that you can be faster or smarter than them uh, and ahead of them. You know, it's this kind of race to zero. Um, But what you're pursuing is finite and it requires an advantage. So either some sort of structural advantage, information advantage, speed advantage, or intelligence advantage. Uh, And that's the shallow, bloody waters full of sharks that I'm talking about, where it's a gladiator pit. Um, And there are people that are much smarter and faster and better networked than I am that I guess can concede, can um, succeed in that, um, I personally think it's going to be a rotating crop of winners and that, you know, as soon as your luck runs out and someone else, you know, outflanks you and then now it's your time turn to fail. I, that just, that's fine, but it doesn't appeal to me. Like, I never right. wanted to be all, a- Statistically, uh, variance can explain so much of that. Or randomness can, you know, if there are a thousand people, there's going to be one person who, you know, seven times in a row, uh, flips tails, right? Yes. So having, um, a good, intuitive understanding of what randomness actually looks and feels like is very sobering. Uh, I spent uh, more than a year of my life just studying randomness and it is not what people think it is. And just out of a pure randomness, you can create massive amounts of perceived success out of pure randomness. Uh, But you know that none of it's real. But if you cherry pick it the right way and you just keep folding things that don't look great and just keep randomly generating more and more stuff, you'll have this marketing machine that's just got incredible track records and outcomes, but none of it's real and none of it's going to work going forward other than if it just continues to be lucky. So understanding that and then you take that and then you reconcile it against real life where you see all this success being marketed to you and you look at the numbers and conclude that's even worse than what randomness would provide on its own, right? So um, that's the kind of stuff, that the kind of base rate statistics that scare me away from this really interesting, potentially exciting world of machine learning. And I know I'm going to get a bunch of hate mail for this, but I'm being honest. So um, that's the um, exploiting an inefficiency philosophy is something that doesn't appeal to me because it's temporary. You know, inefficiencies in the market are temporary and they're finite. Right. And they rely on skill and advantage um, and speed and strength and networking and intellect to exploit. And I look at that and say, it's a diminishing opportunity. On the other hand, there are structural risk premium that are psychologically tough, but they scale nicely. It's not crowded. For whatever reason, the glory seekers don't want to come over to this side of the business and do it this way. They prefer the gladiator pit on the other side. So it's less crowded, which I like. It's scalable, which I like. And it's psychologically tough, which I like, which means I think that it's reliable and structurally real. 
So I'm very happy that um, everybody wants to go the other way. I say everybody, but it's like two thirds uh, wants to go the other way. Um, and that, that's it. I mean, it's that simple in my mind. Hey there, sorry to interrupt. A lot of Forward Guidance listeners are not into crypto. If that's you, please skip ahead, get back to the interview. Some Forward Guidance listeners are into crypto, some own crypto, a smaller percentage owning lots of crypto, and a much smaller percentage work at crypto hedge funds. If you're in those latter two categories, BlockWorks Research might be a good fit for you. BlockWorks Research is a research and data platform that analyzes governance, tokenomics, and models of interesting crypto projects, including new protocols. There's a lot of edge that can be gained from reading these reports. You can check out a sample report at www.blockworksresearch.com research and hit the free report toggle. If that is of interest, full subscriptions can be purchased at www.blockworksresearch.com slash sign dash up. You can also get 10% off using the discount code guidance 10. Thanks. And let's get back to the interview. Right. So you, one of the uh, risk premiums you said you, you'd like to harvest is you know, the grain farmers, they all like to you know, short, uh, short into a rising market, for example, and you get to harvest that risk premium. I guess you know, you're getting the premium, but by taking a risk and that risk is, oh, I could buy grain and it could go down. So you are taking risk. What are some examples, some other risk premiums that uh, you, you, uh, you know, like to harvest? So the one you just described, I call the risk transfer uh, premium. So you're been, you're essentially providing an insurance like service to people that want to hedge off um, meaningful risks in their core business, and in return, you know whatever risk premium they pay should flow to you over time. And that one's beautiful because you can do it amongst a lot of uncorrelated markets that are independent from one another, but also independent from the stock market. So that's kind of our primary uh, risk premium that we're going after. Uh, the other ones are super simple and not exciting at all. We have the equity market risk premium. I believe that if you delay gratification uh, and you're willing to take risk over time, you know, by providing companies with capital and subjecting yourself to 50% drawdowns, 20% vol and 10 year flat periods, that it's reasonable to expect that you will be rewarded with some sort of an equity market risk premium over time. And this is what the index fee, equity index futures? No, it's the ETFs that we use. So we have a dedicated, long-only global equity ETF uh, position in in the fund, which is generally about half our money. is just dedicated to long-only global equities. Got it. When when I think risk premium as applies to equities, it's okay. You know, bonds pay a certain percentage. Now it's five. It used to be zero, and equities have to pay me a certain amount above that because equities are inherently more risky. So equities need got to pay me 8%, whether it's, you know, dividends plus buybacks plus earnings, retained earnings, whatever. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's why when bond yields go up, you know, you know by valuation models, uh, you know, other assets are, are worth less too, if, if bonds are less. How does risk equity risk premium apply in the way you're saying it? Well, I'm familiar with, uh, that model. Uh, I actually think it kind of works the other way around. Um, where you start with equities and it goes the other direction, but I don't have a strong opinion on that. Hmm. Um, Very interesting. Yeah, I, well, because you don't see it actually play out, right? Yields went up. Did the equity market um, it, did valuations go down? I would argue they've actually gone higher. So they, they did uh, for a little bit, but you're right. The the Nvidia at four hundred dollars is not something that that theory would expect when interest rates were from zero to five percent. You are absolutely right. Yeah. So. No, I would say that for us, it's really simple. We got the risk transfer premium on the futures portfolio, right? And then we're collecting the equity market risk premium on half our money. And then the balance is going into a laddered treasury bill portfolio. And we're just getting the risk-free rate of return, which I consider a premium over cash. And that's it. There's three There's three that we're harvesting. Um, th- what's powerful is they work well together as a team, right? So you could look at a futures program and see, you know, uh, modest returns, modest volatility, modest drawdowns. And then you look at the equities and they have, you know, modest returns, high vol, high drawdowns. And then T-bills have very modest returns, but no drawdowns and no volatility. They're all uncorrelated with each other though. And when you pull them into one program and you use the same pool of capital to finance all three, there's magic happens where the returns actually stack on top of each other. They're accretive. 
but the volatilities dilute each other and shrink the overall volatility and the drawdowns actually fight each other and it becomes much smaller, like a third uh, of what any individual um, inputs drawdown would be. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about the, the second one, that equity risk premium, uh, you, you know, what, how, how are you harvesting that? And just, you know, t- tell us a little bit about that. So we, um, we put about half our money into eight different ETFs. Four of them track the U.S. stock market, and the other four track uh, developed Europe and developed Asian markets. And so they're just low-fee, uh, tax-efficient, um, liquid ETFs. And our goal is to be have about half of our money in those ETFs. And we're al- we allow that to fluctuate. It can go as high as two-thirds of our money or it can go as low as one third of our money, depending upon whether we're in a bull market that's pulling that allocation higher or in a bear market that's pulling that allocation lower. And we expect to get whatever that, you know, global, basically the MSCI world index delivers, you know, that it's almost the same thing. Uh, and we, we characterize that as the global equity market risk premium. Got it. So in what way would it differentiate itself from buy and hold? Is it selling on the way down, buying on the way up? Trend following as well? No, it's not. It's it is essentially buy and hold. Um, okay. But context is everything. So we start off with a fifty percent allocation, and that's what we did in twenty twenty. And then we allow it to fluctuate around on its own. We have a hard cap at sixty six percent. We won't let it go above two thirds, uh, and a hard cap at thirty three. We won't let it go smaller than thirty three percent of our AUM assets under management. So we don't rebalance back to 50-50 though. Those are just guardrails. We won't let it go any further. If it's going to go from 33 to 66 or from 66 to 33, it's got to do it on its own. Now it's very tax efficient. It results in very low turnover and it's trend following in nature, but we're not actually in there trading it. But here's what's interesting. The same indexes that underlie those ETFs are also in the futures program. So we can take short positions mm. in those, and those act as a hedge against those, to some degree, a hedge against those ETFs in declining markets. And we can also buy them, like we have recently, uh, earlier uh, this year, that can add um, to get you to almost be 100% invested in equities if you're in an actual bull market where you know your cash equities that you own are going up, but also the futures markets are hitting new six, nine, and 12-month highs. So that's why in 2020, you said, how did you end up getting long towards the end of the year? And that's how it happened is that, you know, we got way down there, but things reversed. You started getting buy signals. The futures come in, they pad the thing and bring your equity exposure up to something that's going to be suitable uh, in bull market conditions. Got it. And so that and that treasury position or the cash position, are those like relatively short duration treasuries? Yeah. So it's generally going to be two to nine month T-bills three to eight typically. Um, and it's nice, you know, right now we're getting 500, 550 basis points on on what should be risk-free. Although I'll, I'll tell you, it's not completely risk-free, um, but that's as close to risk-free as you can get. And it's nice to get, you know, 500 basis points of yield on a third of your money. Um, it's a nice tailwind. Does that play into your models at all? Like, you know, if when interest rates were at zero, you could either put it into bucket one, the futures bucket, the CTA, whatever, you know, uh, um, macro trend bucket, or the equity bucket, or the uh, treasury bucket, bucket number three. Bucket three used to yield zero. Now bucket three, as you say, yields 5%, 5.5%. Does that, you know, does the, does the system want, does the system chasing for yield and say, actually, you know, let's put a little more into bucket three, or is it, is it, no? In, indirectly, it does kind of feel that way, but let me tell you structurally what happens. So if you, let's say you took a look at our futures program, just the futures program, ignore the T-bills and ignore the ETFs for a minute. And you said, hey, Eric, I love your futures program. I'm giving you a million dollars. Go run your futures program. I would take your million dollars, but I only need a hundred grand to run the whole futures program. That's it. All you got to do is make the margin deposits and that hundred grand would give me double what I need for the margin deposits, right? So what do I do with the other $900,000 of your money? Well, I put about 500 grand into equity ETFs, right? So I still have $400,000 left over. That's what goes into the treasury bills. It's just cash, right? Or not all of it, but most of it goes into the treasury bills. So they're not 
they are different buckets, but they're not competing for the capital because futures are so capital efficient. Mm. You've always, at least for a, for a program like ours, which is not a super high risk program, our margin deposits are very small. Um, you know, that's four or five, six percent of the money needed to run the whole futures program, which means we've got ninety to ninety five percent that potentially just sitting in cash, which we deploy into ETFs, and then the balance goes into treasury bills. So they don't have to compete with each other for capital. Does that make sense? That does. So, you know, Eric, I uh, want to ask a question that, you know, I, I, I don't want to give you uh, too much question. I don't want this to be too easy of a, of a question, although it may be a deceptively hard question. But, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your performance and you don't have to say anything, but I've said, you know, you know c- compared to global equities or the S&P 500 since you started in January 2020, your, uh, you, I'm, I'm, the results that I'm looking at are uh, your fund compares positively on return as p- particular annualized volatility. Now, so many active managers promise what it appears you have delivered over the past, uh, you know, th- three, three and a half years. And yet we know, I mean, you read all the time, 90, 90% of 95% of active managers underperform the index. And in some cases they perf- underperform it dramatically. Uh, what do you think it is about what you've done? Like, what is the special? I mean, is it just, you know, because you're not watching TV and everyone else, or do you, or do you think it's luck? I mean, what, uh, I mean, because, you know, there are people who do exactly what you do and, you know, maybe they, their results are not as good as yours. What, what are, what's the secret? Oh, I would say that what we're doing is very different from what your typical active manager is doing. Look, there's nothing special about me. If you, if you forced me to be an active manager, just taking stocks, I, I wouldn't expect to have results any different from the median active manager, which yes, generally yeah. underperforms and delivers high tax consequences and whatnot. So that phrase active manager can mean so many different things. Very true. So, but if, if you truly look at our portfolio, what you're going to see is these guys own a bunch of index ETFs and they're essentially buy and hold. They don't trade them. They, they, you know, they're not generating tax consequences. They do their tax loss harvesting. Well, that's pretty boring. Why would I pay for that? And then you look across and you see, well, they just own a bunch of T-bills. What's the big deal there? Why would I pay for that? Then you look at the futures portfolio. And I feel like we have a rock solid, um, old school, plain vanilla, very durable and reliable futures program um, that is based on you know 50 years of research. Um, not that I was doing research for 50 years, yeah. but we go back to 1970 and really analyze what worked and what didn't work and why and try to figure out why. So, and think back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago about the capital efficiency. So I can get all, the magic is getting all three with the same pool of capital. I just have this durable, humble, good futures program that's totally uncorrelated with equities. I pair it up with equities and I have a lot of cash left over. And then I pair that up with treasury bills. And because they work so nicely together as a team with the volatilities offsetting and the drawdowns offsetting, but the returns building on top of each other, it creates that track record that you were just alluding to that seems to be compelling. So, and that's really important to me because I I believe I'm okay owning equities. I'm okay owning T-bills and I'm certainly okay with the futures program. So each one of those I'm I'm okay with, and I'm a very conservative person. Uh, I'm not looking to take risk. I'm not looking for excitement. Um, Those shouldn't you shouldn't get an edge from doing that. It, the edge is bringing them all together into one under one roof with the same pool of capital. And all you got to do is play around with Excel, three uncorrelated variables with a positive expectancy, hit F9, rerun, and you just see magic. It's just the magic of compound returns applied to diversification. And it's what everyone in the world preaches. They just don't actually do it. But having the big boys, didn't they? The big boy CTAs kind of get their, uh, uh, you know, take, take really get uh, a lot of pain handed them in March and April because you know if you were the 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 the, the trend trade was to short rates, uh, and and rates ex- exploded lower, so you know the the prices exploded higher, um, and I just I just know a, sort of there's a huge unwind. And CTAs did pretty badly in March and April, right? Yeah, and so did we uh, on that on that particular day. I think we had a lot less financial exposure. But that goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of this podcast, where there is a tiny bit of discretion about leverage. And what we're running is is a not very leveraged. I mean, it's a pretty tame uh, futures program, and it looks like. And I was watching that day. A lot of our my peers in the industry, for some reason, had a lot of leverage on, and they were very short a lot of different fixed income products, in particular. 
uh, short dated interest rates like euro dollar, euro yen, Euribor, uh, short sterling. And those things had like an amazing, it was like their biggest Mm -hmm. two day up move in 50 years. And they were on the wrong side of that. Uh, and we just didn't have anywhere near as much exposure as, as some of them. So, um, we, we still felt the pain, you know, we were, we were short bonds, you know, over in Europe and in the U S um, but just not as bad. So, yeah, but that's just one day. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for them, yeah, some of them lost five, six, 7% in a day. Um, we have the futures program, but we combine it with treasury bills and equities. So we had a much tamer, um, day. And and equities again, have been rip roaring, uh, over the past two months since then. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the diversification, it cuts both ways, right? Like it, um, it lowers the risk. It also lowers the, you know, your, your, uh, those big down days where in a pure futures program, like we have them, they're just in there mixed in with the rest of the stuff that was, um, you know, helping not hurting on the same day. Got it. Well, we talked about AI a little bit, Eric, but it's my understanding you're, you're somewhat pessimistic on artificial intelligence, not just as it applies to uh, a finance, but perhaps in, in general, did, am I right in that or no? Yeah. Well, pessimistic. I don't know if that's the right word. I mean, I use AI every day. I was using it this morning before the podcast, um, trying to learn, you know, trying to, um, use it productively. And I've found that, you know, there were some questions that have been, you know, dogging me for almost a decade, eight years that I've, you know, I've got a whole library of books. You can't see them, but they're over there. Um, you know, on financial engineering and and macro stuff that I've been reading for a couple decades now, and I've never been able to answer a couple of questions to my satisfaction. You know, I've probably spent over a thousand man hours on Google, you know, talking to people on the internet, looking for answers. And I just couldn't get answers that I wanted. And then 45 minutes on chat GPT, uh, I was able to get all the answers I wanted because I can redirect it and it can tell me where to look. And, you know, it's like, so there's power there um, to acquire knowledge that has been elusive, but knowledge is not wisdom and wisdom is more important than knowledge. And I don't see, well, and I'll share this with you too. So uh, chat GPT has learned to tell me what I want to hear. Really? Yes. It, it, it's to the point where I've changed its mind you know, inside of my own little ecosystem I built. And it now I can, I can talk to it about something in a totally different context than it can take my political view on it and, and parrot that back to me, even though it had the opposite view in a different context, you know, it's the same logic. We just reframed the argument and used different variables, but it's now engaging me in a way that is, um, more in line with it's it's a yes man it's become yeah it's become a fan over over time um and the other thing i noticed is that it what lies sometimes it's just wrong uh and it only knows what it, it only has the knowledge that is consensus basically is right so it's it basically is a very buttoned up consensus machine Uh, And consensus is great, but we know if you've studied history, consensus sometimes is catastrophically wrong. Um, So it's it's a great tool for gathering the consensus knowledge base. Two problems with that: knowledge is not wisdom. Um, (laughs) They're they're cousins, but you know one's much more important than the other. And the consensus sometimes is just absolutely horrifically wrong. So that's my concern about AI in general, or at least the what's being presented to us right now. Structurally, AI, yeah, has a lot of. Um, I already gave it praise, you know, that I was able to solve a problem that I couldn't solve on my own, despite you know massive effort on my part. So, and the, the sky's the limit on being able to solve problems. Um, but as long as you don't need its wisdom, and you don't need something that deviates from the consensus view, sky's the limit. So that's very powerful. When it comes, um, yes, so go ahead. Well, it, it, with respect to trading, you know, we talked about this a little bit. I, my, my view is that the structural risk premia, there's nothing new since feudal Japan. It's the same thing. You know, it's, it's an insurance like phenomenon in the markets. Um, and you can't create, it's not alchemy. You can't create new risk premia out of thin air. And I could be wrong. Um, but that's my current view from a risk reward perspective. I look at using AI to uncover risk premia that no one knows about. It's probably a bad bet. 
Now, for the people that want to be in the shallow, bloody waters with the other sharks looking for inefficiencies, it's absolutely essential, right? It's it need, You need to go beyond that. Um, but again, you're, you're, you're pursuing something that's finite, transitory, uh, and, and you're competing with the smartest people in the world. Um, that's essentially, those are the elements of a bad business decision, in my opinion. So I go the other way, blue ocean. Your firm, Standpoint Funds, uh, on on video, people can see that. on the, That's the Twitter handle, at Standpoint Funds. So people should check that out. Been a pleasure interviewing you. Uh, my final question is, do you think psychology is the reason why trend following has a you know, pattern of working? In other words, if you buy something that's going up, uh, that's going to work, is is, is, does psychology have a play to, to role, uh, play a role in that? There's an element of truth to that in highly speculative markets where the retail public has access. I mean, the retail public's probably not doing that in soybeans <laughs> yeah. or, or Chicago wheat. Um, but there's an element of truth to that. I think it's very temporary. I think it's a small component. And it's, it's a small component that people pay a lot of attention to. There are moments uh, in the markets, in a stock or a futures contracts life where everyone is glued to the screen and they're looking at it. And when people are piling into an overbought, exponentially rising market, that's when everyone, the media, everyone, even my mom is looking at that market, right? And they pay attention. So they remember that moment when they bought something that was up, you know, 80% and it went up another 20 and they're like, yeah, we all pushed it higher, you know? But in the grand scheme of things, if I were to look at a trend following system over the past 50 years and uh, do an accounting audit of the profits over the 50 years, you know, 90% of the profits are going to come from these non-bubble like conditions where no one was really worrying about why the trends were the way, the way they are. And a lot of it comes from the term structure component anyway. So I guess that's a long way of saying yes in the moment and it seems important, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it's a, it's a minnow in a pond. Okay. So, so 10% of the reason why trend following works is psychology, you know, rough approximation. So what's the other 90%? Uh, I mean, do you, do you know why trend following works or are you one of those people who said, I don't really care why it works. I just care that it works and I'm going to perfect it. Well, I certainly care why it works um, because I want it to be sustainable. You know, this is a, a career for me and I could have done a, a lot of things. Um, so to, you know, performance chasing is not what I signed up for. So it needs to be um, structurally there. I need to be convinced that I'm actually adding value. So provide, by providing liquidity to hedgers in their moment of need uh, allows them to expand production um, and to lower their own financing costs like that. I, I'm, I earned my spot in that ecosystem by, by owning that little piece of real estate in the ecosystem that's sustainable. So I think that it's the, you know, the hedger speculator, the risk transfer premium is real. Um, and I think it explains most of the, most of the profit margins that trend followers collect from the futures world. And I've done some other work where you can just take the data and randomize it, um, and then stick it back in there and run it and all your profits go away. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you just end up matching the risk-free rate of return on your T bills. Right. But there's just something about the, the trends and the term structure. And then you can, you could roughly or crudely approximate that to the hedging losses from participants over time. It used to be easier to do. Now it's all complicated and mixed together and consolidated financials, but roughly I can kind of see that, you know, and the other thing to think about is that, you know, they don't need to lose 10% for us to make 10% because those futures contracts are inherently leveraged by design, right? So I don't need some transportation company to lose 10 for me to make 10 because mm -hmm. I'm only putting up the margin, right? That's why it's important that you do more than just the trend following, I think, to have a truly, you know, counter cyclical multi-asset global portfolio because trend following can stop working and not work for five years. Sometimes the hedgers win. You know, otherwise, why would they do this? If they lost every single time, they wouldn't do it. In fact, they want like a 60% or a 70% win rate. So they need to feel good most of the time in order to justify losing, you know, two, 3% a year uh, over the long term. Got it. Final question, I promise. If you feel comfortable, could you tell us how Standpoint is positioned on the price of gold right now? Because people are, it's a battle. You know, the longs, they believe it with, you know, in their heart of hearts and the shorts think that the longs are making a big mistake and it's too crowded of a trade. What does what your data indicate? Yeah, well, so any, any short, medium, or long-term trend follower should be long and strong gold right now. Got Statistically, it. it should, every, any trend following model should be long gold. Uh, not silver though, and not the industrial metals. 
So most of the industrial metals are short, copper, zinc, nickel, um, aluminum. So that's interesting. You've got precious and not even silver uh, is not even an uptrend anymore. So there's something, somebody's going to get smoked in this trade. So yeah, um, I, w- the fundamentals, I don't know. You know, gold is a weird one. It's, it's some, it's, it's a commodity. It's a monetary asset. It's a, the only thing I believe I know about gold is that historically it hasn't been the hedge against inflation that people think it is. It's a hedge against unexpected inflation. And it's got a weird mm-hmm. relationship to real yields that I don't fully understand. Um, and you know, where it's 2023, it's not 1976. This is a different world, you know, and there's different there's different competing products, there's crypto, there's other things of uh, different central bank. Uh, policies and philosophies. So it is what it is. I have no idea if gold's going to triple or if it's going to get cut in half. Um, but you but if it does get cut in half, your process will have gotten you out of the trade well before then. Unless it gets cut in half overnight. But yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Um, we structured an asymmetric payoff, you know, and we're long gold and hopefully it goes up in a lot in value and we make a lot of money. If it doesn't and it goes down and hits our stop loss, we're going to book a small loss shrug it off and move on to the next uh, whatever whatever comes after that. Got it. Well, Eric, thanks so much for, for being so generous with your time and insights. And uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Jack. Take care. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.